Welcome to Functional Programming with Zio workshop. So this is an all-day workshop, and it's going to try to teach you how to build asynchronous and concurrent applications with a library called Zio. And along the way, I hope that many of you will learn a lot about what it is like to do functional programming in the large. A lot of us have been doing FP in the small for many years, pattern matching, and maybe using immutable collections in Scala and other types of things, but it turns out that you can actually take these same techniques of functional programming and you can use them to build the macroscopic structure of your application, the whole structure, the big picture, interaction with the external world. And when you do that, you actually gain tremendous abilities for testing your code, for reasoning about it, for snapping bigger parts out of smaller parts, and also for, you, you gain abilities that you simply don't have in the world of procedural programming. We'll look at a lot of those later on today. But you gain capabilities like the ability to never lose errors or to propagate errors between different parts in your application losslessly. Or to trivially do parallelism and concurrency in a way that doesn't have any race conditions or, or deadlocks. So you actually gain tremendous power from a functional approach to doing async and concurrent programming. And, and we'll see that as, as the day progresses. So this is a hands-on workshop. We're working on getting some power cables for those of you who aren't next to a plug. Hopefully later on in the day we'll have that. And work, worst case, we could play musical chairs a bit and get people to scoot around a bit as your battery gets a little low. So what I hope you all have is an IDE or text editor all set up and ready to compile Scala. And what you should do is you should hop over to GitHub dot com. Let me just show you where it's at. So github.com slash jdgoes slash zio dash workshop. And you're going to see a bunch of files in this repository. Just clone this repository. If you know how to use git, just clone it. If you don't know how to use git, then simply download as a zip and extract it to your local computer system. So github.com, github.com slash jdgoes slash zio dash workshop and pull those files onto your local system. And then once you've gotten that far, try to compile this project. It has SBT in it. It actually has an SBT launcher script. So you shouldn't need anything if you don't want other than be connected to the Wi-Fi because the first time you run SBT or IntelliJ ID, it's going to try to pull in the dependencies of the project. So it's going to have to download some stuff. So that'll take a second. And then get yourself into a point where you can compile this project. And what you're going to find is you're going to find a directory structure that looks like this, the Zio workshop, and then there's going to be a project directory you can ignore, a source directory that has all the source code files or the workshop material. Inside source, drill down into main, into Scala, into net, into degoes, and open up the directory Zio. And inside there, you're going to find the following directories. You're going to find one on essentials, one on concurrency, one on architecture, and one on applications. And today's workshop is going to cover mainly essentials, and I hope actually to bounce around a bit and, and touch on a little bit of concurrency and maybe a, a little bit of applications there if we have time. So to start with, though, go ahead and pop open that essentials directory and open up the file effects.scala. This is where we're going to start. And then while we don't have, with a class this big, we don't have enough time to stop if anyone has difficulties. If anyone has difficulties, please use the LambdaConf Slack and reach out to other fellow attendees who are in this room and can sort of help you behind the scenes resolving any troubles that you have getting this project up and running. The other thing I recommend that you do right now is hop over to gitter.com or gitter.im, sorry, gitter.im, that's G-I-T-T-E-R dot I-M and go to jdgo slash functional dash scholar. This is a chat room specifically for this class. So I'm going to occasionally, from time to time, I'm going to ask you to 
paste in solutions that you have to some of these exercise problems. So just go ahead and paste them in there and I'll, I'll take a look at them and it'll help me gauge the progress of the class over time by seeing those solutions in there. <clears throat> Gitter.im slash jdgo slash functional dash Scala. Yeah. All right, so open that effects.scala file up and we're going to start at the very beginning, which is functional programming. So functional programming. In functional programming, we build our systems out of functions and functions are total. That is to say, if you give them an input, they will always give you an output. They're deterministic, which is to say, if you give them the same input, they'll give you the same output. And they're also pure. And that means that a function, the only thing a function does is basically combine its inputs to its output. It doesn't actually interact with the external world. And that raises a problem if you want to do pure functional programming inside industry, and that is much of the code we write, in fact, I'd say the majority of the code we write actually has to interact with external systems. We have to interact with databases. We have to interact with web APIs. We have to interact with third-party systems. We have to interact with the file system. We have to interact with the operating system. And all of that is, classically speaking anyway, outside the realm of pure functional programming. So how do we solve that problem? Well, functional programming provides a very simple solution to every problem, and that simple solution is as follows. Instead of doing something, take that and package it up into a value that describes the act of doing something. This is called functional programming, but it could just as well be called value-oriented programming. You're programming with values. So instead of, for example, making a database call, you make a data structure that describes making a database call, and then you use that data structure, you, you have functions that build that data structure, and that data structure represents, in some sense, a description of your interaction with the external world. That's the trick to doing effectful programming in the world of pure FP. It's to don't do things, describe them. Turn them into immutable data structures, that have a bunch of different operations in there and, and provide operations that allow you to compose bigger data structures from smaller ones. And then you can end up building this very, very big description of how a program interacts with the external world. And, and obviously this, this technique helps you do pure FP that is also applicable to real world software programming. But beyond that, we'll see later today how this technique of translating doing something into describing something actually allows you to weave in capabilities because once you have this thing as a data structure, you can add a whole bunch of features that are not inside your programming language. You can add it into this, into this data structure. And then this data structure, at the end of the day, it's nothing more than a description. It still has to be translated step by step into the operations that it describes. And as it's being translated into these effectful operations, the, the runtime system for this can go ahead and give you very powerful features like easy concurrency or safe interruption or timeouts or resource safety or other types of, types of things that are not embedded into the host programming language. It's like functional programming asks you to build a mini language inside the host programming language and then instead of actually using the host programming language, you, you, build the, you interact with the external world using this mini language and then you take and you end up building this data structure that represents a type safe program that describes your, your entire effectful program and that's interpreted by a runtime system into the operations that it describes. Let's take a look at how this looks for the simplest possible effectful program or class of programs that we could imagine, which would be console based programs. So in console programs, we only need two operations we need an operation to print a line of text to the console, and we need another operation to read a line of text from the console. So let me show you how we can do this. We're going to create a sealed trait here called console of A. And um, this sealed trait console of A is going to have two different operations. This is going to be an enumeration, a sum type, if you will, if you're familiar with that terminology. And we're going to put two operations in here. One is going to be called 
um, write line, and it's going to model the act of writing a line of text to the console. Note here that this is just a data structure. It's a data type. It doesn't actually do anything, but it stores a line of text that you might want to, at some point in the future, write to the console. We're going to have this extend console of A, and then we're going to make another, um, sorry, console of, uh, we'll, we'll store two things inside here. We'll, uh, we'll store the line of text we want to write to the console, and then we'll store the rest of our program. So console of A will, in some sense, represent a console program that, at the end of the day, will return some value of type A. So console of A is a console program. It can do input-output. And when it's all done, it's going to return a value of type A. So this write line says, OK, I'm going to describe the act of writing a line of text to the console without actually doing it. And then after I describe that operation, I'm going to provide the rest of the program, which will ultimately return the A. So this is the, the continuation, the successor, the rest of the program. If you want to think of this as being one statement in our program, then this is everything that comes after the current statement in the program. And now we're going to write another one called read line. And the read line is going to say, well, it's going to store a function. And the function is going to say, give me the line of text that is read from the console, and I'll give you the rest of the program. So note here, read line is not actually reading anything from the console. It's just, just describing what should happen after the driver for this data structure, the interpreter or runtime system, after it reads text from the console, it's going to take that line of text and it's going to feed it into this next function, which will then return the rest of the program. So now we have a, a data type console of A that represents a console program that returns an A value. And we have two different operations. One that describes the act of writing a line of text to the console and then the rest of the program. And another one that describes the act of reading a line of text from the program by using this function that, once past that line of text, can give us the rest of the program. So we have two operations for console of A. And um, these two operations are actually not enough. So this only allows us to describe infinite programs. There's no way out. There's no way we can stop the program. If you look here, there's no terminal leaf. Our two different operations both have next of the program, so we can only describe infinite console programs using this. So we might want to terminate at some point and actually return that A. So instead, we'll, we'll add one final operation, and we'll call it return. And return of A is just going to store that A value inside it. So there we have it. We have a console program that is described by three terms of a sum type. This is a three-way enumeration. Each one of these terms in the sum type describes an operation that we can do in our console program. Now, let's see if this is enough to write a simple interactive program. Let's give it a try. Well, in an interactive program, we might say, hello, what's your name? And then the next part of the program is going to read a line of text from the console. And then given that line of text, we're going to say, we're going to do another write, write line. Good to meet you. And then we're going to put, put that line of text, whatever it was, the name of the user. And then we have to provide the next program here. And in this case, we're just going to return the name of the user. So what does this have type? Well, if you, if you look at this carefully, it's going to have this type. or sorry, console of string. It's going to have type console of string. <coughs> oh, sorry, I, I meant to call this one name there. Good catch. All right, so this has type console of string. Why? Because it returns a string way down here. This is the end of this program. So now we've built up an interactive program. We've built it up using a data structure that is totally immutable. Um, so what we've done is we've gone from doing effects to describing them using immutable data structures. 
And this doesn't actually do anything, of course. This is nothing more than a value, but you can consider you could actually build whole programs out of these different operations that represent, they model, in some sense, they model interactive programs. In fact, you can model the entire class of interactive programs with a data structure that is as simple as this, that has only three different terms. That's the secret of functional effects. So if you've heard of things like IO monads or task monads or whatever it is, all those things are, are data structures that describe the act of interacting with the external world. That's all they do. They don't actually do anything, they just describe things. And, and what we could do to make this easier to use, it's not very convenient to build programs like this because they're all weirdly nested and um, it's not very, it gets even worse once you try to build larger programs with this. So the, the real way to do this is to build um, what's called some helper functions and then some operations that allow us to take standalone little programs and compose them together. That's what we heard in the talk this morning, category theory. Category theory is all about composition. Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna define some operators that allow composing um, these different programs together. But first, we'll write some helper functions here. One called write line that's going to return a console of unit. And this could be write line for this line of text that you pass into it. And then it's gonna call return with unit in there. So this is a short self-contained program. We want, to, we want to make this more modular. We want to enable us ourselves to build up our big programs out of small programs. So we're making this short self-contained program that writes this line of text and then returns a unit value. And then we'll go ahead and do the same with read line. Read line is, is just going to, it's going to be a program that returns a line of string and how it's going to do that, it's going to call read line, it's going to call the read line constructor and then it's going to be fed that line of input and it's going to immediately return that line of input. Oops, I need to move that up there. All right, so now we have these two little mini self-contained programs. We would like to be able to start stitching them together. We want to take write lines and read lines and be able to compositionally build up bigger programs from these two pieces. In order to do that, we need operators. Operators are the key to composition in functional programming. Operators let you take two similar values and combine them together to get another value that's similar. So that's what we need to do now. <coughs> One of these operators is actually gonna be derived from a functional programming abstraction called functor. Functors have a map operation. Lists have map operations, futures have map operations, all these things have map operations. We're gonna write a map operation here, and it's gonna have the standard type signature that map does, and how you can view a map operation is as a way to map over the return value of the program. That's what map does. For any given functor f of a, map lets you map over that return value, the a, inside the program, that's returned by the program, map over it and turn it into something else. So let's go ahead and see if we can implement this following the types. What do we gotta do here? Well, you just have to match against um, the, the self, the, the this object here, the this console, and this console is gonna be one of these three different things. Just match against it to figure out which one it is. And you'll have the right line case You'll have the read line case, and then you'll have the return case. In the read line case, we're trying to build, um, sorry, I got this type wrong, this should be B. We're trying to build the right line that has um, type console B. So to do that, we're just going to recurse on the rest of the program. We're gonna build up this right line, we're gonna pass along that line of text on modified, and then we're gonna take next, and we're gonna map over that. So we're gonna recurse on that case. This is a recursive case because the right line stores the rest of the program, so we'll just recurse onto the rest of the program and map over that value. And read line is not too much more difficult. Um, we're just gonna build a lambda here. And what we'll do is we will call, uh, we will call um, next using that line of input and then we'll map over that using F. And then this is the most interesting case. These are just basic recursion. Like we can't actually do anything other than recurse in these two cases. Um, the terminal case of this recursion is gonna be the return value. Here, 
oh, we get a value of type A that we're returning, and we're going to rebuild that. We're going to return. Instead of returning that A, we're going to take that A, we're going to feed it to the F function to get our B. So we're going to take the A, feed it to F, F gives us the B, and then we're going to stuff that, stuff, stuff that inside, inside the return value. So you can see this map operation, what it does is it deconstructs the program step at a time, and it gets to the return statement. Oops. It gets to the return statement. And once it finds the return statement, it looks at that value, it has type A, it takes that A value out and it sticks it through the F function to get a B, and then it reconstructs that return statement. So map is actually an operation that edits our console program, looks all the way into its return statement and grabs that A out and, and turns it into a B and gives us the same program unmodified, otherwise unmodified. That's what map does. All right, so this allows us to take a read line and map it, for example, I can take read line here and I can map it, I can do the map operation here, and I can convert this string into an integer, like getting the length of the string of input, for example. So that's handy. However, map, which comes from, from functor, it's not powerful enough to allow us to take two programs and combine them into one. It allows us to take one program and turn its return value into something else, but it doesn't let us take two programs and compose them into one. That's the critical bit of functionality we need if we want to have a way of compositionally building up sequential programs from individual smaller programs. And to do that, we're going to introduce the most powerful way of composing two programs together sequentially that you can imagine, and that is flat map. This is the monadic composition. Um, to introduce flat map, we're just going to write this thing that has the following type signature. Instead of this A function returning a B, it's going to return a console of a B. I'll cover that, what that means here in a second. And then it's basically going to be more or less the same functionality up here, except um, what, what's going to, all these are going to change to flat maps, so just copy paste that. And then this return, instead of returning the F of A, it's just going to call the F of A, because the F of A is directly going to give back a console of B. And there, there we have flat map. Um, so, what is this flat map operation doing? Well, it's editing the program in some sense. It's, it's matching over the different operations and it's deconstructing that program, digging into it, and it finds the return statement. And when it ha finds the return statement, it takes that A and feeds it to this function F here. This function F represents the rest of the program. You give this function f and a, which is produced by the first part of the program, and it will give you back the rest of the program. It's like a callback. It's like a callback. The function you pass to map is like a callback. So if, a, if we have some console program A here, and you call flat map on it, you give it a callback that will, as soon as this program produces its A, that A will be fed to your callback, and your callback gets to, at that point, decide what the rest of the program is going to be. It's a continuation. More precisely than a callback, it's a continuation. It's a continuation of the program. And why flat map is so powerful for building up programs compositionally and sequentially is that we can take one program console, um, we can take, for example, this, uh, this read line operation, and we can flat map over that, and now we have a line of input, and now we can write line that. So this is a program here. This, this now is the composition of our read line and write line. And what it does is it reads, it describes the act of reading this, and then after, after it reads it, that line of input is fed here, and then we return a new program that will write that line of output to the console. So the program that we return here depends on the input value. This program here depends on this input value. So we've created a particular kind of sequential composition where what comes after depends on runtime values produced by what came before. That is monadic composition. Monadic composition is a style of sequential composition where what comes after can depend on the runtime values produced by what came before. It turns out that is equivalent to procedural programming. That is imperative programming in a nutshell. 
when we're writing imperative programs, we have statement by statement by statement, and subsequent statements depend on runtime values produced by preceding statements. So monads are important in functional programming precisely because they embody the essence and the power of procedural imperative programming. Well, now that we have flat map and map, it turns out that we can write this whole program in a different way um, using um, these flat map and map operations. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to change this to right line. I can remove all these type annotations. I can, I can flatten out this structure a little bit. So we're going to ignore that unit. And we're going to do a read line. And we're going to have the name. And then we're going to do a right line. Uh, with good to meet you. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to map this, ignore the output of right line, which will be a unit, and ignore that, and I'm going to return name here. So this program here is equivalent, well, aside from the fact that it's not compiling, it is equivalent to the preceding program. What's that? Ah, oh, right, yes. Missing the flat map in here. All right, so read line dot flat map. All right, so now we have this, this new program here that it's more modular than the other one. The other one, we were building up this big nested data structure and the types of what was inside uh, percolated up to what's outside. And here now we're taking two smaller pieces, right line and read line, and we're composing them together using map and flat map to build up our whole program. So we've succeeded in breaking down this big monolith into operators and primitives. And we take and we combine the primitives using the operators to build up more complex things. This is a better way to design a functional effect system. Now, Scala has some syntax sugar for things that look like this. If you see a chain of flat map operations followed by a final map, then that actually can be written using a so-called for comprehension. And for comprehension is nothing more than syntax sugar for a bunch of flat maps followed by a final map. So we're going to rewrite this here using for comprehension. And this is going to make it even more apparent what the sequential linear flow of information is inside this function. Now you can read this more or less like an imperative program. You can say, we're writing this line of text to the console. We're ignoring the unit that we get back from that. Then we're reading a line of text from the console. And then we're writing, we're reflecting the name of the user back to them. Oops, I don't need that final map. And then we're yielding that name down here at the bottom. And this yield will be translated into a map operation on the right line. So there we have it. We have this program here. And this program is nothing more than a data structure. It's a data structure. So unlike traditional programs, a traditional program in procedural programming is a collection of statements. We don't have a collection of statements here. We actually have a data structure, an immutable data structure. And so we can treat it as a first class value. That means we can take this value and we can stick it inside data structures. We can actually pass it to functions and return it from functions. We can build combinators that work on programs. We can build a combinator, for example, that takes a list of console programs and turns it into a console of a list of whatever. This gives us a newfound ability to manipulate our programs as first class data. And that's one of the most powerful things about functional effect systems is that your programs are lifted into the world of values. And when they're in the world of values, your programming language provides a myriad of very powerful features to abstract over values and create values from other values. And you know how to work with values, so you're very good at like working with numbers in a list. Well, this is the same thing. Console programs are nothing more than values, and you can treat them, interact with them, reason about them, test them the same way that you do any other value in your programming language. 
Um, is there any issue with the stack? Because I know this uh, your map and flat map are not using scale breaker. This is not stack safe. So this this is a toy example. It's great for teaching. It's not so great for building infinite console programs. If you do that, you'll eventually get into a, a stack overflow exception. But you'll probably get tired of interacting with your programs before you run into the stack overflow exception. All right, so that's the secret to functional effects. Instead of doing stuff, we describe it. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a look at a few exercises that are gonna help you work through this. Um, first off, if you haven't coded this flat map for console, then go down into this effects object and code it now. So you have uh, the read line, you have the write line, the return. They look a little bit different down here. The main thing is the return is lazy. So it's actually a function from unit to A. It's not just a plain A. Anyway, you can, you can easily extract out the A by calling this function by giving it unit. So anyway, write that flat map function if you haven't already. And then um, the map is here. And I want to introduce you to zip, which is another handy thing. And I'll actually implement this one, or although you're welcome to do it yourself. Zip takes two console programs and zips them together to give you a tuple of the, the return values of each. So if you have a console program that returns an A and a console program that returns a B, you can now zip them together to get a console program that returns a tuple of A and B. And what is the meaning of that? Well, the meaning of that is it does this console program's one first, and then it does this one's operations and then it gives you the return value of both inside a tuple. How do you do that? It turns out it's very simple if you have flat map to do this. All you have to do is do this program first, flat map, that gives you the A, and then you do that, and then you map over that, and that gives you the B, and then you stick the A and the B in the tuple. So your implementation for zip will be flat map to that dot map, sticking the A and the B in the tuple. It's zipping two console programs together in a sequential ordering which makes sense for console programs. You want to do this one, and then after you do that one, you want to do this next one, and then you want, you want the things from both of these programs together in a tuple. And there are some, there's some syntax here for two common operations. These are called zip right and zip left. So zip right is the same as zip, except it maps over the tuple and throws away the return value of the leftmost program. And zip, or sorry, that's zip right. And then zip left is it zips them together and maps over the output of that tuple and throws away whatever is on the, the right side of the program, the rightmost program. So you can zip two things together, zip two console programs together, and you can throw away one side or the other, throw away the return value of one side or the other. Why would that be useful? Well, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example of where this is useful. If I have um, some right line, I can now do right line, hello, and then zip right, right line, goodbye. What is this program? Well, this program is, it takes the left side and zips it together with the right side. And what's the return type I get out of this? When I zip these together, what's the return type? Tuple of unit unit. Tuple of unit unit. When you, when you zip two things together, you get a tuple of their outputs. The left side gives you unit, the right side gives you unit. If you zip these two things together, you get back a tuple of unit unit. But a tuple of unit unit is not super interesting, is it? A tuple of unit unit has no more information than unit. So you may as well throw away one side or the other. It doesn't really matter which one you do. I choose to throw away the, the left unit and keep the right unit. And this gives me the much nicer type signature of I get out of here a console of units rather than a console of tuple of unit unit. But also, I could use it in more complex scenarios like what is your name? And then here, I want to do a read line. So I'm going to do read line right after it. And what is this going to do? Well, it's going to zip the right line together with the read line to produce a tuple of unit and string. But the unit's useless. I don't need that. So I'm going to throw it away by mapping over that tuple, which is what the zip right operator does, and throwing away the unit and keeping the string. So the zip left and right operators are used very often because it's common to want to zip things together and to only want to keep one side or the other. Now it's very important to understand that zipping two things together, zipping two programs together, and throwing away one side of that tuple or the other 
is not the same thing as just running the, the right side or the left side of the program. It's not the same. For example, this program is not the same as this program, even though they have the same type. The type of this one is console of string. And, and it has console of string because it, again, it, it zips those together to get a unit string here, and then it maps over that tuple um, to discard the unit and keep the strings. So you end up with that type. And this one has type console uh, string. So we have here two things that have the same type, but they have different meanings. It's like if you have two lists, lists of, two lists of ints don't necessarily have the same ints inside them. It's the same thing here. Two console programs with the same type don't necessarily have the same instructions inside them. They don't. And these two programs have totally different instructions. This one has this instruction first, and then followed by this, and then it only keeps the return value of the right-hand side. Whereas this program only has the, the read line in it, it doesn't actually have the right line. And if you drill down into these data structures, you can imagine them as being sort of unfolding trees. Drilling down into them, you can see the differences between them. These are not the same programs, even though they have the same types. All right, so let's skip ahead some. And what we're going to do in this exercise here is implement this uh, function called unsafe run. So unsafe run, is a critical function for a useful functional program. Its job is to take that data structure and translate it step by step into the effects that it describes. So how are you gonna do that? Well, map over program, match over program, sorry, and let's see if I can get some help here. Yes. So you have three cases to match against, read line, write line, and return. And your goal in writing this procedure is to translate every one of these three instructions into the operations that it describes. So the next here um, says, give me a line of input and I'll give you the rest of the program. So to translate this into effects, what you do is you actually read a line of input from the console. So this is going to be scala.io.stdin.readline. This is going to effectfully, side effectfully, this is not a functional thing to do. This entire thing, it's called unsafe for a reason. It's called unsafe because this is not a function. This is a procedure. This breaks all laws of functional programming reasoning and so forth. You can't use equational reasoning with this. It might blow up at runtime. It's definitely not going to be deterministic. This is not a function, but it's something that's necessary. You only need to use a function like unsafe one run a single time at the top level of your program, in your main function, for example. So mostly you can do FP everywhere, except maybe in one place in your application at the edge of the world, where you have to take this data structure that you built and you have to translate it into the operations that it describes. So read that line of input from the console. After you do that, feed it to next. And that will give you back the rest of the program, which you're going to have to unsafe run it. So you're going to have to recurse on that. And on the right line, you just call print line on that line, and then you call unsafe run on the next part of the program. And then finally, this return value, you just evaluate that. Remember, it's a function from unit to A, so you just have to call that function with the unit value. And then if you compile this, it should work. You have implemented your own interpreter for your own custom programming language. You have a custom programming language described by a data type called console. And now you've written your own interpreter for this mini programming language. This interpreter goes over the operations, the instructions of this data structure, step by step, and translates them into the side effects that they describe. Now you can take this unsafe run and you can go back and you can compile that hello world program that we wrote. You can interpret that. And you're going to see it does exactly what we said it would do, which is it's going to ask you for your name, it's going to reflect it out back to you, and then it's going to return it. All right, so there's lots of other things we could do. We're going to do, I think we're going to do one more thing. We're going to implement this for each function. This for each function is going to loop over a bunch of A's inside a list, and it's going to call the body on every single one. The body is going to return us a console program for every A inside the list. And then we're going to collect all the B's from everything inside here. We're going to collect all those B's 
into a list and return a program that produces the list. This is a, an effectful for each loop. It's an effectful for each loop. If you've done FP for a while, you'll recognize this as the type signature of something known as traverse. So to implement this, match against con uh, values. And if you get a nil, well, you're, you're kind of done. You can do console.succeed with an empty list. If you get back an A out of here and maybe some more A's, then you have to do the following thing. You have to do body on that A to get back a console of B. And then you're going to recurse on uh, the, the tail. So you're going to do for each on the A's. And then you're going to zip these two things together. Zip this with this. I'll actually use zip with. No, I don't. Do I have a zip with? I don't think I do. I do not. I just have, I just have zip. So I'm going to zip these two things together. And then that gives me a tuple of a single B and more Bs. And then I'm going to map that to B cons Bs uh, body is what I'm missing. And there, there I'm done. And you may not exactly understand how this works, but you don't really need to. You just need to follow the types here and see what they permit you to do. The types only permit you to do one non-trivial thing, and that is um, you end up feeding this A into the body of the for loop to get back your console of B. And then you have to recurse on this. And then at that point, you have, you have a console of B and a console of a list of Bs. So you have two console programs. One has a B. One has a list of Bs. And you just want to cons those two things together. But the hard part is they're in different console programs. So how do you combine two console programs into one? Zip or flat map. Flip flat map or zip. So you do that. And now you have a console that contains a tuple of the A and the, or the B and the list of Bs. And once you have the B and the list of Bs inside the same context, well, you can just map over that tuple. And then you can just cons them together in the ordinary fashion. So this allows you to implement for each an effectful version of for each. And how would you use this? Well, you could use it like, like this. In this example program, we do for each questions, we could do the following. Here's our, here's our question. We're going to right line the question, and then we're going to read line the answer. So here is our effectful for loop. That is traversing over all these questions. And for each question, it is writing that line of text to the console. And then it's reading that the uh, line of input, the answer to the question from the console. And this ends up giving us a list of answers. Oh, sorry, this, this is not the right type. But uh, you'll get to the right type in the next answer. <coughs> this will actually give us back. If you do this, you're going to see you get the correct type, which the one we want at the very end of the world, which is a console of a list of string. So it's a console program that produces a list of strings, which are, which are a list of answers to the questions. So what have we done here? Well, we've, we've written a program combinator. For each is a program combinator. It, it takes um, a list of A's and a way to turn an A into a program and gives us back a program that produces a list. We're operating on programs as if they were first class values. And that's part of the power of functional effect systems. All right, so I think that's enough of these exercises. Let's see here. Is there anything I want you to do? No, that's, that should be enough. So we're going to stop here. The main thing, if you want, if you have extra time, go ahead and, and do these exercises here at the end. But we're going to stop here. And we're going to proceed. But first, let me review what we've covered to date. So pure functional programs, they don't do things. They don't do things. They don't interact with external systems because they're built from functions that are total and deterministic and pure. So how do we solve? What's the great insight that allows pure functional programs to solve real world problems? What is that insight? Anyone recall? Describe, don't do. So describe, don't do. Instead of doing interaction with the external world, describe it. 
using an immutable data structure. And so you end up building these data structures by having some primitives and then some operators that allow you to compose the primitives together to build up more complex programs from simpler programs. But all our programs here are nothing more than values. They're immutable data structures that describe operations. And then once we have one of these data structures, it doesn't do anything still, it's just a description. So what do we have to do? What do we have to write in order to actually interact with the external world? Yeah, there's some additional work we have to do if we want to produce a useful program. What is that? Unsafe run. An unsafe run is that function, actually it's not a function, it is a procedure It is a procedure, oh, I, it looks like I have some remote difficulties. It is a procedure that step-by-step -step translates every operation into the effect that it describes. Now, is unsafe run a function? Is it total? No, it's not. It's not total, it's not deterministic, it's it's full of side effects, but there's only one place in your program you have to call it, and that's your main function. Or if you're integrating with some framework, there may be a few main functions, the entry points, whatever it calls back into your function. So you may have to call it a few times. But by and large, you don't have to call it often. It allows you to gain all the benefits of FP. So reasoning benefits, testability benefits, pushing information into types, type-directed reasoning, and so forth, in most of your code base. And then push those sort of messy details out further, where yes, they are going to affect reasonability and testability, but you can at least limit the damage they do by isolating them to those small parts of your program where you need that functionality. And we're going to now switch gears. For remote attendees, I did something with the screen. Is that any better? Okay, great. All right, so we're going to switch gears here and focus on uh, Zio. So this console thing is great. It's great for learning, but it's not an industrial grade effect system. It doesn't have any way to handle errors, for example. It will stack overflow. It's not very performant. And it can only handle two operations, console operations. And who's building console programs? Our programs today, they interact with databases and web APIs and, and everything. They interact with asynchronous, asynchronous effects. They have to be concurrent. They have to be parallel. They have to not leak resources. They have to be efficient globally from a global perspective. So programs today are way, way, way more complex than we can handle with this toy data structure. So we're going to go beyond the realm of toys. And we're going to look at an industrial grade library for doing async and concurrent programming. So Zio is a library that helps you build modern applications. Modern applications are always asynchronous. So people have stopped writing programs that block a whole bunch of threads because they don't scale well. So today's programs are asynchronous. More and more stuff, especially on the JVM, is moving to be asynchronous only. And um, modern applications are also concurrent. And they're concurrent because Moore's Law, basically. CPUs stopped getting faster they're not getting any faster. Instead, they're getting more and more cores. And a server, a server computer might easily have 32 cores. So if you want to write efficient applications, then you need to do two things. You need to make your programs asynchronous, um, which is what like Future does, and you know, callback-based code is all about. And then you need to make it concurrent and or parallel, so take advantage of those cores so that you can reduce application latency. Make your programs fast, speedy, and capable of high throughput. Because in many applications, throughput is somehow connected to the revenue that the business makes. If you're doing e-commerce, for example, and you take too long, the customer goes elsewhere. If you're shipping data across the wire and you take too long processing it, you miss out on key insights or your customers complain. So throughput and, and latency are extremely important, and the way you solve these problems is by writing asynchronous concurrent code. But it's not easy to write asynchronous and concurrent code these days. Programming languages aren't really designed for that. And there's lots of problems that we run into. I'll give you an example of one. 
So asynchronous code, you know, what happens if you want a version of try finally that works across asynchronous code? Oh well, you're out of luck. There is no, try finally does not work for async code. Try finally works exactly for synchronous code. And it works great for synchronous code, but we're no longer writing synchronous code by and large in today's business apps. So we're missing something. Like the nature, the changing nature of modern computing has forced us to have fewer and fewer tools we can use inside our programming language because we're moving into different modes of computation where our languages really weren't designed for them. And that's where libraries like Zio can help because they give us the primitives, the building blocks that let us do async and concurrent programming in a safe, reasonable, and very fast way without having to do a lot of work. And so we're gonna take a look at, at Zio today. And we'll, we'll start at, so go ahead and open up the file called zio.scala. And we're going to start at the very beginning, which is the Zio data type. The Zio data type is an effect. It represents a functional effect. So by functional effect, I mean that all the good rules of FP apply. This is total deterministic and pure. Everything's immutable. You can look at the types and know what things do. You can test these things. You can reason about them using local reasoning or equational reasoning. So you can refactor your code safely. All the great benefits of FP that you may have heard about, they apply with this Zio data type. And it's a functional effect. Um, in that it models an interaction with the external world. It could be an async interaction or a synchronous interaction, it could be some sort of error, could be a resource effect. Maybe it models interaction with an environment. Um, it, it models some type of interaction with the external world. And there's a number of different models that you can use when you're, when you're building these effects. It is immutable. It's nothing more than a data structure. And it has three type parameters. Ordinarily, you don't have to use all three. You can actually use simpler versions that are baked into type aliases that are baked into Zio for common cases in which you don't need the full power of the Zio effect type. But ultimately, at some point, you're either going to want the full power or you're going to run into it somewhere. And I don't want to, I want to make sure you're not confused when you see it. So I'll take the time to describe each of these three different type parameters. The three type parameters are as follows, R, E, and A. R is the type of environment that is required by the effect. So different effects may require different things of their environment. For example, some effect might require configuration information, like it might require database config. Other effects might require actual database connection. Other effects might require a web API service, a third-party web API service. So effects can require different things. The E-type parameter represents the type of value with which the effect may fail. So different effects can fail for different reasons. Throwable is a very common type to use for E, but also you could use exception, or you could use your own custom data type if you're modeling errors inside your business domain, you may want to use your own custom data type and plug that into E. And then finally, A is the type with which the effect may succeed. So an effect, a Zio effect, REA, requires an R and might fail with an E or succeed with an A. And there's a nice mental model you can use to understand what a Zio effect is, or at least get an intuition for what it is. And that is, you can understand it as a function from R to either an E or an A. It's like an, it's an effectful version of that. And it's a model of it, it's not actually this. It's a, it's a model of such a thing. Because there could be concurrency and other types of things going on behind the scenes. This is not, doesn't actually do it justice, but in your own mind, when you look at a Zio REA, you can understand it as a function from R to either E or A. And what does that mean? It means you feed it an R and it gives you back either an E if it failed or an A if it succeeded. Now let me make a note about any and nothing, two special types in Scala. Any is the super type of every other type. Any is the super type of every other type out there. Whether it's a primitive or a, or a non-primitive, if it extends any ref, any is its supertype. 
Nothing, on the other hand, is the subtype of every other type out there. And what that means is nothing can be treated as a value of any other type. There are no values of type nothing. So nothing, there are no values of type nothing. It's this theoretical type. It doesn't actually have any inhabitants in Scala. You can't construct a value of type nothing. But it turns out for a nice th theory and symmetry, it's useful to have such a thing. These actually correspond, by the way, to initial and final objects in, in the category theory talk that you heard this morning. Basically, you can map any type into unit. And, and also, given nothing, you can go from nothing to all other types. You can draw an arrow from nothing to all other types. So those are initial and, and final objects in category theory. Um, anyway, there, there are very deep reasons why we have such things in programming languages. They're, they're symmetrical, and, and they allow us to have these unified type theories. Uh, and it turns out that both any and useful are nothing in the ZO data type. They're useful as follows. If you have an effect that doesn't require anything, then what type do you think you use for R? Well, if it were nothing, would you be able to call that effect? No. Right, so if you use nothing for the, the R type, then you would not actually be able to run the effect. If you ever see an effect with nothing here for R, it means the effect is unrunnable because you're never going to be able to summon up a value of type nothing that you can feed to that effect. So let's say we're, we're trying to model an effect that has no requirements on its environment. What type would we use? Any. Some people say unit, some people say any. The difference between them is as follows. An effect that doesn't require anything from its environment will use any because you can feed it anything. You can feed it unit, but you could also feed it a number or a string or anything else you wanted. Whereas an effect that requires unit has to be fed a single thing, and that is unit. The distinction is one of those effects requires something definite. Now it turns out that it's very easy to get your hands on unit. <laughs> it's just sitting there. So it's very easy to feed that effect what it needs. But that is an effect that has a very specific requirement. Whereas an effect that has any as its input type, as its environment type, that is truly an effect that has no requirements at all. It doesn't require unit, doesn't require anything. You can run that with any value of your choice. So when you're modeling an effect that has no requirements at all, you use the any parameter for R to indicate that it has no requirements whatsoever. And because of the way any and nothing work in type systems, you get special properties very powerful compositional properties that you would not get out of using unit to model an effect with no requirements. First off, that doesn't model an effect with no requirements. It models an effect that requires a unit. But second off, you're going to run into compositional problems due to the way that the type system works. Now, on the flip side, we've already seen if you plug in nothing here for R, then you can never run that effect because you can never summon up a value of nothing to give it. However, what happens if we want an effect that cannot err? What type should we use for that error type? Nothing. Yes. Why nothing? Because it can't produce a result and nothing can end up. Exactly. So, so if we stick nothing into that type slot, then that's an indication we can never get an error out of it. Like if you ever see an either of nothing string, you always know something about that. What do you know about either nothing string? It's always going to be a right of string because no one could have constructed the left-hand sign because there are no values of type nothing. So when you plug nothing into that slot parameter, that means that no one can construct that, that side of the either. And that means that your effect cannot fail. Now let's, let's say we, for some reason, we're thinking about an effect that's going to run forever and it's never going to succeed. This is a while loop. It's just going to keep on accepting socket connections until the end of time or until someone takes the server down. What type parameter would we use for the success value A? Nothing, exactly. Such an effect can never end. I mean, it can fail. It could end that way, but it could never succeed with a value. Now, there might be some class of effects. For example, a server 
that has a while loop that catches all errors in processing connections. So it cannot fail and it cannot stop. It's just going to keep on going forever. What type might we use for both E and A in that case? Nothing and nothing. So if you see a zero effect that has nothing and nothing here, that means it's basically some kind of loop that just keeps on going forever and ever, catching all its errors and doing something with them. So the types of zero effects tell you a huge amount. They tell you what the effect requires, they tell you if and how it can fail, and they tell you if and how it can succeed. So at a glance, you can look at a zero effect and you can know everything that's going on with it. What we're going to do is, just to gain familiarity with the zero effect type, we're going to do a series of exercises rather quickly. Exercise one, you're going to write a type alias using the zero effect. You're going to write a type alias for a, an effect that might fail with an error of type E or succeed with a value of type A. So what do you use here? What's the answer? So you would do, yeah, Z O N E. E A. Why? Because this tells us this effect doesn't require anything and it can fail with an E or succeed with an A. Does that make sense? All right, on to the next one. Z O N E nothing A? Yes. Oh, yeah. You could reuse this one if you want. Fail or success, nothing A. Or you could go back to Z and you could be Z O N E. Any, nothing, A. How about exercise three? Um, well, this one can fail, so it's going to be, yeah, it can fail with an E. Yeah, fail or success, E, nothing, basically. Or if you want to spell out the full thing, Z-O, any, E, nothing. How about exercise four? Yeah, any nothing, nothing. Yeah. All right, now let's take a look at the effect types built into Zio proper. So all these are just sort of made up. You're not going to see them in Zio, but there are some type aliases that are baked into Zio that you will see today. Let's take a look and recreate these. Um, so IOEA is an effect that can fail with an E or succeed with an A. Task of A is an effect that can fail with a throwable or succeed with an A. So this, is, this corresponds to the old Scala Z task, Monix task, Cat's IO, and roughly speaking, future. This is an effect type that can fail with a throwable or succeed with a value of type A. This type occurs commonly because in low level parts of your code when you're interacting with other low level systems, they're going to throw throwables. Yeah, or maybe exceptions, maybe some specific type of exception. Um, but that's where this, the commonality of this type comes from. It's from interacting with this exception throwing code. And then this type is actually quite handy. It's an effect that cannot fail but could succeed with a value of type A. This one is commonly called UIO. The name comes from Haskell. Haskell has a, a library called unexceptional IO that represents a, an IO type that can't fail. All right, so let's take a look. We have another 20 minutes here before lunch. And what we're going to do is we're going to see, we've seen what the types mean. And we've seen what an effect means at a high level value, sort of going through the whole describe, don't do introductory example with console. But now what we're going to do is we're going to try to actually build effects. OK, we're going we're to actually build effect values. And we build effect values, by and large, by using methods on the companion objects of the Zio effect type, or one of these type aliases. So all the type aliases you've seen that are baked into Zio, like UIO and task and, and IO, 
they have companion objects as well, and you can call the methods on those companion objects. Z only has one effect type, it is always Zio, and everything you get back, you're actually de dealing with a Zio effect, but it's still convenient at times to use the type aliases when you don't need those extra type parameters. So we'll, we'll build a variety of different effects, and you are welcome to choose your own method for building them. You can build them using the Zio data type, um, or the command, companion object, or any of the other companion objects. There is no difference. Uh, the only difference is, <laughs> the only difference is IO is baked into Zio. So this type alias occurs inside Zio, and the other one does not. But yeah, this this here is exactly the same as fail or success. Okay, so Zio succeed is the basic way that you take a value such as the number two, and you stick it inside an effect that succeeds with that value. So if you, if you already have a value and you just want to stick it inside a Zio effect that when run is going to produce that value as its success, then you use Zio succeed. So in the first exercise, use Zio succeed to put the number 42 into a Zio effect. And what you do here is you do Zio succeed and what type do you think you're going to get back from this? UIO. Yeah. You're going to get back a UIO of int. The Scala compiler knows this effect cannot fail and it doesn't require anything. That's something that you're going to see here is all the methods you use, they're going to give you back precise types that tell you what can actually happen. Your Scala compiler knows that. IntelliJ IDEA knows that if you're using IntelliJ IDEA. So you have a lot of help here for telling you what's going on. Well, sometimes you don't want to succeed eagerly, you want to succeed lazily. That is, you're, you're, going to do a, you're going to construct a big data structure and you don't necessarily want to construct it now because you, you're not absolutely sure that this value is going to be used. So if you run into such a situation, you use something called succeed lazy. In this case, I create a gigantic list. Don't run this code. Do not run this code because it just builds up this monumental list. You might run out of heap, I don't know. And then it turns that list into a string, which is your CPU is going to be spinning forever, the way, the way string concatenation works. You're going to burn many CPU cycles doing that. So don't run that. Just stick that into a zio.succeed lazy to defer the cost of that. What do you think the type of this will be, by the way? Uh, UIO string? Yeah, UIO string, exactly. Now, just like we can take values and lift them up into zio effects for representing success, we can do the same for the failure error channel. That is, if we have a value, we can lift it up into an effect that fails with that value. And you do that using the zio.fail method. So fail is the opposite of success, fail, success. One does the success channel, one does the failure channel. So we could describe an effect that fails with a string here by using zio.fail incorrect value. What do you think the type of this will be? Say that one more time, IO string nothing. That's right, that's exactly right. So this is an effect that cannot succeed. And of course the compiler knows that. It knows this effect cannot succeed. It is doomed to fail. And, and when it fails, it will fail with a string value. So Zio's error channel, it's not fixed to be throwable or a subtype of throwable. You can use it for anything. Obviously you can still use it for throwables and exceptions but you can let your error types vary dynamically depending on what part of your application you're in. And you can eliminate it. In fact, when you catch errors in Zio, that error goes away, it goes to nothing. So you have static compiler time proof that you've handled an error, which turns out to be very useful for reasoning about code. Now, remember the console example that we had. We baked in two interactions with the external world. One of them was read line, one of them was write line. That technique does not scale. People tried to scale it. This is what free monads were about. <laughs> we're going to take all the operations out there in the universe and we're going to bake them into giant co-products and we're going to stuff those in free monads. If anyone's ever done that before, it's a whole lot of fun. Well, not really. <laughs> it's, it's not fun. It doesn't scale very well. And the reason is it's just inconvenient to have to build 
one single case class for every operation that you ever want to do with the external world. It's very powerful in some ways. It's very powerful. It's just too much work. So instead, modern effect systems allow you to interact with the external world in a totally different way. And this way involves giving it a hunk of procedural code. And given any hunk of procedural code, you can take that and you can stuff it into a Zio effect. Now, Zio does not execute that effect. When you do that, it just stores it inside a data structure. So it's like you're taking a bit of Scala code and it's being stored into a Zio data type that says, in here is a procedure. And when the entire Zio effect composed together Zio effect is run, it will go ahead and peek inside this data structure and see this hunk of procedural code and it will execute it inside that unsafe run function. That's what happens. And this may seem like a cheat, and it is a cheat. This is a cheat. This is how you cheat the system and don't have to create a different operation for every possible interaction with the external world, but it's one that turns out to be very handy. It actually doesn't break any of the laws of FP. I'll show you, I'll show you that. So let's implement exercise four, put Sterline. What type is this gonna have? Any nothing unit. Any nothing unit, otherwise known as UIO of unit. So we're gonna take ZO effect total and call print line inside there. And what happens is this takes this hunk of code and sticks it inside this ZO effect. It doesn't actually run it. So if we give putster line the same string, we get back the same ZO effect. And not only that, but every single string we give it, we get back an effect. So it's deterministic and it's total. And also the only effect of calling this function is computing a return value. It doesn't actually interact with the world. So it's also free of side effects. So using this simple technique, we've turned print line into a pure function called putster line. This is a pure function, total, deterministic, and free of side effects. Um, oh, well, so I'll get to that in a second. Right. The question is, well, can print line throw an exception that could screw things up? The answer is print line can't throw an exception. It try catches over things that it might otherwise throw. So this is a total effect, actually. If, if you were not using total here, then the return type of this would turn into task. But we'll talk about what happens if you get this wrong later. All right, so this is how you interact with all the external systems out there, especially all of your legacy code, all the Java code out there, all the Scala code that's not written in a functional style if it's not already using an effect system. And there are lots of libraries out there that use effect systems, so FS2, Doobie, HTTP4S, Acor, uh, um, Frameless in the world of Spark. There's tons of things out there that, that use uh, functional programming concepts and functional programming libraries and functional effect systems. But if you're interacting with legacy code, non-functional code, just take it and plop it into an effect constructor like zio.effect. That's all you do. And now you've turned it into purely functional code. And now you can interact with it through the rest of your program. And also, importantly, you can push off error management and thread management and all the other nasty things, blocking thread pool management, all that nasty stuff that you otherwise have to worry about. You can push it into the Zio library. Zio has the ability to manage threads and blocking threads, as well as error propagation and defect propagation, all this other stuff for you. So doing that not only lets you program in the functional style and, and use a uniform style over your entire code base, but also gives you other nice properties that we'll spend time talking about later this afternoon. All right, so some functions throw exceptions when you call them. And the effect constructor here, ZO effect, lets you take that kind of procedural code and safely lift it into a ZO effect. And how it does that is it translates exceptions over here into failures over here. So it's a translation layer. It says, okay, you can throw whatever you want over here that will be translated into a zero fail value. Pure functional programs, they don't use exceptions. They use values. 
to this translation layer, which happens underneath the scenes, very efficient, very fast, and so forth, is is necessary that so that you can um, basically use use Zio as a pure FP library. So to do that, in this case, you just write task here of string, and then you write scala.io.std in dot readline, and now you've lifted that up. Stuffed it into a, a task which can fail with any throwable. Yeah. So it does not lose the stack trace. You have the stack trace, and not only do you have the stack trace, but in Zio you get something that's way more powerful than a stack trace. So if you've ever tried to debug future code, future-based code and look at the stack traces in future-based code, you know that they're useless. Why? Because every single operation on a future is a fresh submit to a thread pool. If you look at a stack trace from future-based code, it tells you a lot about the insights of future and nothing about what your code did. So stack traces and asynchronous programming, they don't go together. They're not friends. And that's a major problem. When something goes wrong in our async code with future, we don't know what's going wrong. It takes us a lot of time to figure it out. Zio has what are called execution traces. Execution traces go into a method. So let me show you an example. So ex execution traces go into a method and tell you line by line exactly what happened, even across asynchronous boundaries. And they also uh, support concurrency. So if you have a case where two concurrent threads come together or they diverge apart, then you can see the execution traces across those boundaries. If one uh, thread, they're called fibers in Zio because they're more lightweight and faster than threads, but if one, if one of these fibers um, forks off another fiber on the side, a side computation, if you will, then if it fails and prints out its execution trace, then you can see that it came from this one. You have that full tracing information. So execution traces, they are what stack traces should be, basically. They give you more detail because you can go inside the method. It's not just the call stack. It's the actual trace of things inside the method. But beyond that, they work across async and concurrent boundaries. Um, and and they, you don't have to do anything to get that. It's just out of the box, baked in. And, and they will even tell you what the code was supposed to do after it continues. So they tell you what happened in the past, but they also tell you what was going to happen in the future had the code actually continued. Question? That is incredible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what's the overhead on that? Can we turn it on and off? Or is it you on? can turn it on and off. By default, it's on now. In RC5, it is by default on. And even with it on, it's still 50 to 100 times faster than future. <laughs> After it's warmed up. It, it has to warm up to get that level of speed. But yeah, there's no reason for there's no reason not to leave it on in your production code. It's that fast, and it's so detailed that it's it's going to change how people debug asynchronous code. Right now, it's a huge pain to debug async code. Zio makes that super easy. All right, so effect is how you take these potentially throwing bits of code and lift them up safely into Zio effects. Effect total is for things that you know to be total. You're basically making a promise. You're like, I swear it's going to be total. It's not going to throw. And if you're wrong, well, there's still ways to deal with that. But basically, you should try to be accurate. <laughs> if you don't know whether or not some foreign piece of code throws, then you should use effect just to be on the safe side. Uh, what's an example of some Java code that you know to not throw exceptions? You know of any Java code out there that doesn't throw exceptions? Yeah? Which one? Oh, yeah. <laughs> all, all the numeric operators in Java across all the primitive types, they don't throw any exceptions. What else? Div except for division on, on integers, throws. Yeah. What's that? The floating point, I believe, for, for exceptions as well. Yeah. Java system time. Java system time. System time can't throw an exception. So there are many, many methods out there, a lot of constructors actually. So if you do new atomic reference, for example, there's no way that can fail, other than ca catastrophe. You know, you could run out of memory, in which case it doesn't matter. 
Yeah. There's, there's nothing that uses any memory at all. You don't know it's not going to fail. Right, but you don't. No, it's not a checked exception, and everything else held. There's even a JVM error. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so there's a class of exceptions on the JVM that could basically happen anywhere. There, when you're out of perm gen space, when you're out of heap space, when you're out of stack space, and when you're out of meta space. So these things can happen anywhere, and you can't predict them. You can't catch them. If you try to catch them, you're just going to cause more problems. You basically don't worry about them. When they happen, the best thing you can do is exit your program immediately, and and hope that it actually does exit because that way your container infrastructure can restart the node um, and hopefully you get some log out of that. But those type of exceptions are not worth worrying about and you should not try to reflect them in types. You should not try to reflect out of perm gem space in your types, that is not a good idea. Questions? Yeah. Is this a good use case for say some of those Java functions that don't throw an exception, they might return a null or return a negative value. If you wouldn't want to separate out the error Yes. Of, uh, yeah, I think so. So here's what I would use the error channel in ZO for. I would use it for any error that you expect and that you think someone at a higher level needs to be able to recover from. If there's some possibility that at a higher level someone needs to recover from this error in order to satisfy some business requirement, if it's an error you expect to happen a lot, then by all means stick it in the error channel type because that way the compiler will help you eliminate that error or transform it into some other error type. And if it's not in the type, the compiler can't help you. Yeah. Uh, Zoom? Something going on with Zoom? Please show an example for example, the first one with int. Too easy. Uh, so, zio succeed hello, for example. That's an example of this, the type of this would be UIO of string. This is an effect that is always going to succeed with a string value. UIO of string. Doesn't need anything, doesn't fail, succeeds with a string. That's an example. Is that good enough or? Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I am, I'm talking to your past self 20 minutes ago. Okay, so let's let's do um, let's do what should we do here? Let's do zio effect. This is a really interesting exercise. So, what we're going to do here is this is a this is a function built into Scala that can give you the contents of a file as a list of strings. In real life, you should never use this function because it has so many problems but it's often used in toy examples. So let's use it today. What we're going to do is we're going to take this procedure, which is not functional, it's not total or deterministic or free of side effects, and we are going to convert it into a pure function. This pure function will be called read file, and it's gonna return an IO effect. Now, does anyone know enough about Java IO to tell me what the error type of this should be? Well, if you're dealing with files in Java, what 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 is the file file? IO IO exception. It's IO exception. All of the IO stuff extends. There's specific subtypes of that for different error cases, but all the IO stuff they extend IO exception. So the the best possible error type you could use here would be IO exception. So just go ahead and fill that in. And now we have to import this effect. We know we have two helpers, either effect total or effect, depending on whether or not it's a total effect. Is this a total effect? No, it's not, because for some inputs, this is not going to give us an output. It's going to throw an exception in some cases. So in that case, we use io.effect. And now what type do we get out of this? Throwable is the air type. But throwable is not the same as IO exception, right? It's, if you try to compile this, you're going to get a compiler error. It's going to say, uh-oh, oh, well, <laughs> two compiler errors. You're going to have to import IO exception. This is the main compiler error. It's saying, hey, I found a task uh, of a list of string, but I need an IO of IO exception of list of string. 
so we got the wrong type here because this code can, this effect here can fail for any throwable. So you sometimes run into the situation where you could change this to be throwable if you wanted, but that's a little too broad. In my opinion, that's a little too broad. If this fails for some non-IO exception, it's a catastrophe of some type. You don't actually want to reflect that in your type. It would be better to stick to IO exception. To do that, you can use a method called refine or die. And what do you think this method does? Based solely on its name. You give it a partial function that's capable of remapping the air. What do you think is going to happen? If this fails for some other reason other than IO exception, then what do you think will happen? Yeah, the fiber that's executing that will die. It's dead. And that's, that's what you should do for unexpected errors, for non-recoverable errors, just let it crash. That's the Erlang philosophy. If you didn't count on it happening, then you don't really know how to deal with it. Just let it die. And what you can do, however, is at some point higher in your application, you can sandbox code. And that makes sense depending on the application. For example, if you're building a web server, then you sandbox at the level of every request. So if something catastrophic goes wrong, bug in the code, you don't know what to deal with it, you kill that connection, but you don't kill all the other connections being serviced. And you can do sandboxing and you know, spark jobs in many other places as well. There's appropriate places where you can sandbox and contain the damage done by catastrophe or errant code. So Refiner Die lets you pick out the air types that you want and maybe change them along the way to some other air type. It's very handy when you're importing something with effect, but you, you decide that's way too broad for your purposes. Yeah. Right. Um, so this, uh, we'll cover that a little later today, but this is, this has some problems basically because, uh, well, this can die along the way to reading the file. And I honestly don't know if this is safe implementation or not. If it dies along the way while it's reading the file, you know, somewhere inside here, if it dies somewhere inside here, I actually don't know if it cleans up. But there are many situations where when you're using more realistic examples, you need to guarantee that a cleanup operation happens. And you can do that in Zio. And that cleanup operation, it's basically Zio's version of try finally, works across asynchronous boundaries and across concurrent code and across parallel code and all that stuff. It just works with the way that we write programs today. It's like a try finally, but it, one that actually works for the needs of today's programs. All right, so I recommend that you you, you do these, and we're, gonna, we're going to resume after lunch with exercise nine. So, uh, so if, you, if you get back early, just work on the rest of these, and we'll resume with exercise nine as soon as we get back. <laughs>